Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. We will be transitioning to a new series. Uh, this series is going to be called Politics in Hawaii, where we will be addressing all of the various important issues that face our people and our islands. Uh, so please join us each week as we discuss with all of our guests. They will be, there will be the people, there will be politicians, there will be opinions editors, there will be people across the board from all sides of the political spectrum to have comment and help us learn a bit more about what is going on and what our politicians are doing, maybe what they should do uh, as well. Uh, so please join us for that. So for today's episode, we're going to be focusing this episode specifically on what is at stake for the Oahu County mayoral race. So to, to really help us explore this conversation a bit, please help me welcome our guests. Today's guests, we have Mr. Todd Simmons, Opinions Editor for Honolulu Civil Beat, and we have Mr. Michael Goloyu, who, several titles, Chair of LGBT Caucus, as well as a member of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, let's, let's jump in a little bit. Let's, uh, okay, so, Todd. Opinions editor from Honolulu Civil Honolulu Beat. I know Civil that Beat. you focus a bit with uh, a Facebook uh, politics page. Tell us about what you do there and how that how that really comes together. So I'm a member of the editorial board. I write editorials and an occasional column here and there. And our focus is really exclusively on Oahu, a city and county of Honolulu. And we occasionally comment on state and federal races. Some federal politics are involved in that too. But really, our focus is almost exclusively local. And uh, that gives us, I think, a pretty strong day-to-day -day insight into what's happening in Hawaii, Excellent. particularly here on this island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sure. this, is this investigative? Is it how, how do you come? Our come website about the is stories? investigative and yeah. public policy in nature, almost exclusively. We don't do lifestyles. We don't do sports. We don't do some of the other uh, errata that you see in other uh, media. But we do focus in on the meat and potatoes that we think people really ought to be concerned about issues that have to do with the way that their government works, with the ways that the city and county and state do or do not work, and the real problems and uh, challenges that we have to tackle to live successfully here in paradise. Uh, well, that's excellent. I know that I enjoy uh, certainly the Facebook page as well as other Thank shows. Thank you. So with that, so again, thank you for joining the show. And it's Michael, my pleasure. tell us about your role within the Democratic Party of Hawaii and some of what you're trying to achieve with that. Um, my role as the LGBT caucus chair, we is we're the largest and oldest political um, organization that deals specifically with LGBT rights issues with uh, daily with education, advocacy, and trying to make sure that the rights that we keep have made so far are not eroded. Uh, it's within the encapsulated within the Democratic Party. We are an official arm of the party, so we have to live and uh, die by all the rules and regulations within the party. Uh, so, but we make sure that. We advocate for everybody along the spectrum within the LGBTQ community, and um, prove, we proved that uh, we weren't done with marriage as we move forward into transgender issues, as well as advocating for elected officials and candidates in the primaries as well in the general elections as we move uh, to make sure that we get people elected that will support and advocate for the LGBTQ community. And that is allowed within the caucus structure? Yes, it is. Okay, because uh, that's an important piece, because uh, I know that there are lines, right? Yeah. There's some, some aspects of the party can do some things versus others, and you have to make sure to not cross those lines sometimes. Uh, within the, uh, during the primary, we can't, um, we can't endorse, but uh, for the general election, we can. Uh, and we educate our members, educate the general public about the differences between some Democrats, because there are Democrats within the party that support LGBTQ rights and across the board. They not only support or are advocates for our community, but unfortunately there are those, since we are the party of the big tent and we actually take that literally, that we do have people that are in the party that do not support or advocate for the LGBTQ community. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, that's a, actually an important conversation maybe for another episode as we go deeper into that. Uh, um, I like to refer to the idea that it's not just LGBTQ rights, they're human rights, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we can stick with it. We know where Hillary is on that stuff too. So. Um, anyway, this is I, one, one caveat that I want to put in this is um, though everyone here at the table, I believe, certainly myself and Michael, are, are uh, Democrats, one thing I want to make clear as far as this series is concerned is we are open and we are willing and we want various opinions from all sides to be able to come and participate and give us input on what is happening throughout our islands and what can and should be done from various perspectives and viewpoints. So uh, I do want to make that clear. 
uh, it's, we all are in the same boat, the same islands. We need to make sure that we're working together in order to achieve the goals that suit us all best, so to help us achieve uh, those goals. So, okay. Um, thank you so much for a brief little introduction sure. with that. Um, all right, so this whole episode today is going to be uh, more focused on, if not entirely focused on, um, what is at stake in our current mayoral, Oahu County mayoral race. So we currently have incumbent Mayor Kirk Caldwell running against, after the primary, uh, running against Charles DeJoux. Um, one thing that gets lost in this is because uh, we've got someone who's a strong Democrat running against someone who's a strong Republican, but this is a nonpartisan seat, isn't it? Intended to be a nonpartisan seat, and at some level you have to wonder why anybody would want it right now because the difficulty factor is so severe going forward. Whoever wins this is going to be uh, immediately uh, tested on trying to find a way forward for the Honolulu Rail Project and trying to obtain the additional funding that would be required to complete that route to fruition or some maybe slightly uh, shorter portion of that route. That's enough, but there are also other big challenges around homelessness and home insecurity, um, around the cost of living, around uh, rental issues, around the infrastructure of uh, Honolulu and uh, city and county of Honolulu. So th there's a lot to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, even for the next mayor, whether it's uh, the incumbent or the challenger, um, this rail project will be nowhere near fruition by the time they leave office. So in some ways, it'll be, you know, a heavy lift for not a lot of thanks at the end of it, too. Uh, so hats off at least to both of these uh, gentlemen for running, uh, because this is a, a very tough job that they're both pursuing. Yeah, it definitely is. and and. We hear more about the Oahu mayor. Certainly, Oahu has the largest population, and most of us here live on Oahu, so there's a lot more focus there. There are other islands, and, and all of the nearby islands have their own mayors. They've got contested races, and it's all very interesting as well. Uh, but because you mentioned the rail, and you mentioned homelessness, and you mentioned cost of living, well, the highest cost of living and, and the highest rate of homelessness and, some of the, and, and the costs of the rail impact the entire state and that's all primarily about Oahu. The rail is 100% Oahu. And if there's going to be additional costs, if there's going to be, if we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for it, if we're going to go to the general public once again and say, well, we have to uh, raise taxes again, right? We always have to hear about raising taxes to pay for something. The entire state ends up having to pay for that. So, Well, I, you know, important to clarify there, yeah. I think that the GET surcharge that's paying most of the um, rail project uh, cost, uh, at least to date, and beyond what the federal government is uh, obligated to pay through the FTA, uh, really is based on what's assessed on Oahu. The other islands might have their own GET surcharge that, uh, that might be levied for, for other purposes, but the one funding the rail project is assessed uh, only here. To the degree, though, that they're coming to Oahu or doing business with Oahu, buying services, goods, and other things that would fall under that tax, then they would also be paying some share of the rail project costs. Sure. I do want to disagree with you on the fact that this uh, only a, and only benefits uh, uh, Wahoo, because the TOD, the trans Transit Development, yeah. the GET that's going to be paid on that and all the development along the rail line goes into the general fund. And the, the state therefore benefits, the entire state benefits. We do a lot of heavy lifting here on Oahu. All the um, money that's being spent on the rail project, the people that are coming getting jobs and going out and spending their paychecks here, their, every tax they spent, every GET every time they go buy something the GET is accessed on them and that goes into the general fund and that and benefits everybody across the state that's an so, important that's an important and, point to make there so, so yes. when people come over here also when people come over here from the neighbor islands when the rails up and running they're not gonna have to rent a car if they're coming here for business they hop on it go downtown do what they need to do and head back to the airport right. or heads out to Kapolei area and so this is going to be or dare we to, say a future ferry Yes, that can bring. Yeah, yeah. I, I throw Keep that hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> for some, for some, some. Uh, not everyone is in agreement. I would like to ride that ferry. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like there. Uh, personally, I think it would be important discussion to continue yeah. to have not just an inter-island ferry, but also an intra-island. And I have to say that our civil beat readers uh, have responded in exactly that way. I think that, that the great majority of them would like to see some 
different mode of transportation alternative beyond what they have now for the airlines exist to go to neighbor islands and, and vice versa. It's very frustrating to them that that didn't happen when, uh, when it might have several years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, they're also, I think, uh, equally strong in saying that there have to be proper environmental uh, assessments and, uh, and inquiries done uh, yes. that would allow that to take place. And so, you know, there, there, there's some balancing there, of course. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we see that happen over and over and over again. Uh, sure. Whatever side of TMT you happen to be on, um, the questions come about, well, was it done correctly and how was it done? And, what wasn't done, and, yeah. and those are the technicalities that oftentimes can sink something, which is what happened to the Super Fairy. So, all right, well, let's bring that back to with all of that. Um, for the mayoral race, if we're talking about, and I, I've been hearing for, I don't know, months about Caldwell pro rail, de Jou anti rail, but that isn't really what's going to happen. Well, not anymore. The feds have stepped in and if Tashu had done his homework before jumping into this race, he would have known what was at stake, and he would have known what the requirements were. I knew, and I'm not even running for office, that I knew what the, FE, FE, the FTE wanted and the, uh, what the feds were going to expect from us. And he has gone from one different program to another different idea what to do with the rail project. And the feds have said all along, this is what we're paying for, this is what we want. And for him to come in and you'd think somebody who's been in Congress would understand that, that the feds aren't going to uh, mess around with what the, we promised them. Mm -hmm. And so for him to say, okay, we're going to put buses on it, never going to happen. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. We promised them steel on steel, rail from Kapolei to Ala Moana. And that was the project. And so for him to come in and say, oh, I, I'm now, I'm now in favor of rail. Well, you should have always been if you were going to run for mayor of Honolulu. Because that's recognized that. I, that recognize that. So it, it tells tells me as an individual, he was never prepared to be mayor when he got into this race, and so he didn't do his homework. So that being, um, so yeah, I, th that that narrative has changed from mm -hmm. anti-rail. And the interesting thing about that is, it's kind of how politics works, mm -hmm. right? He stepped up onto the stage. He found a couple of issues that was going to rally a bunch of people. He actually, as a Republican, has pulled together a number of Democrats. Now, again, it's nonpartisan. However, he has pulled together a number of Democrats to get behind him and support his campaign. But these are the Democrats that were anti-rail at all times. And these are the people that have filed lawsuits time and time again that helped. They, when they talk about the overruns and whatnot, they think this happened in a vacuum and it all happened because of what the Caldwell administration has done or because of Hart. And it's not, they don't take any of their own actions into effect. Right. That they are the ones that helped add to the uh, delays, which cost the cost overruns, which have cost added to the cost. So they're like, oh, not us, we're not mayor, yeah. it's all him. You know, in we're some ways it's kind of inconsequential as to who was for it, who was against it, because immediately what happens now after November 8th is the FTA is evaluating whether the interim options that the city and county of Honolulu yeah. put forward, along with Hart, to say, here's what we might do to complete this project, does it, will this you know, uh, go a long way toward meeting what you want to see out of the project. Right. We're expecting here by the end of the year from the FTA on whether they will allow for another maybe six months for city and county to try to work with the state legislature and others in the community to find a way forward to fund the rest of the rail project. So th that's, that's an in incredible set of things that's going to have to happen over a period of no longer than eight months. And yeah. so whoever wins this seat is going to have to do a lot of work and a lot of convincing, a lot of arm twisting to allow this project to go forward if it is to go forward. Well, without there being serious penalties uh, that we would then have to Serious back, penalties so. in terms of having to pay back $1.5 billion to the feds and yeah. probably being unable to, to complete the project without that. Exactly, exactly. So we're, we'll jump right back into that in one minute. We have to take a quick little break. So again, thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is our new series, Politics in Hawaii. Uh, I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and we'll see you in one minute. Thank you. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. 
Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. What was that? Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers and Reformers, the Politics in Hawaii series. Uh, again, help me welcome our guests, Mr. Todd Simmons and Mr. Michael Galoyu. Uh, we're talking today about what is at stake uh, for the mayoral race on Oahu. Uh, we've got uh, uh, incumbent mayor Kirk Caldwell uh, running against the challenger uh, Charles DeJou. And there's, there's a number of issues where they, where they are different. And uh, though this is a nonpartisan, there are actually are partisan concerns uh, to be dealt with. So we were just talking about rail. Um, so let's jump real quick back into rail, and then we're going to go into a couple of other things from there. So. Um, as far as rail is concerned, one of the things, uh, one of the comments there was that it's going to get built anyway. And we heard from the beginning of the Deju campaign that he was against it and he was going to shut it down. Well, we've, he, he couldn't. And if he would have done his homework, as you're suggesting, he would have realized that wasn't a real option. Well, okay, he's had to transition back into, well, okay, we're going to build it. So his current thing is, what I've heard, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, if there's anything new or any other thoughts about this, is his current thing is, yes, we're going to build it, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it better than Caldwell was doing it. So back to the future, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this yeah is the exactly. Same theme that we heard from 2012. I will say that stopping the project does not seem to be something that the public supports. No, not at all. Uh, our uh, Civil Beat poll, which we released last week, showed that 61% of our respondents in this poll of Oahu uh, voters uh, supported the project being completed, being built to its original plan and having the entire entire 20 mile route uh, completed. Uh, at the same time, only 14 percent were happy with the way that the project has been executed so far. Mm -hmm. So I think for anyone to come in and say we want to stop work, we don't want to finish this, we want to miniaturize it somehow, may not, you know, they may run into a buzzsaw in terms of public opinion on that, but clearly the voters are unhappy with the way this thing has been executed. And some of that I think is, is again, the sausage making process. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to know how that sausage is being made, they just want to be able to consume it when it's tasty. Well, the hard part is how you make get sure there it doesn't here. give them food poisoning. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah, exactly. Any of the metaphors. And there have been so many con issues that have come up in regards to the concrete, uh, what, what what type of concrete they were mm -hmm. using, and, and and crumbling of something. So many challenges that have come up, so many issues that have been demonstrated. At what, where, where in that conversation is the mayor responsible, and mm -hmm. in what way can do you or Caldwell actually have an impact in how the construction itself proceeds? Very little, and that's thanks to the work that DeJou did when he was on the uh, city council. He put the, he's one of the architects behind Hart. So if he's not happy with Hart, that's his baby come to rest. He's the one that made sure that there was this huge, there was this, the mayor didn't decide who had the contract. So they kept the politics, supposedly kept the politics out of the, uh, the building of the rail project. So he, everything he's pointing to that he's not happy about the project are things that he actually had input, input on. Yeah. And so if you're looking, and now we have to look at the whole project as a whole, go looking back at the FDA and looking at who's going to be able to go to Washington and advocate for us. The part, who's the FDA going to listen to? Somebody that didn't want the project, didn't know what they were talking about to begin with when he jumped into the race, or somebody that's been an advocate for it, understands the nooks and crannies, has a history and a, uh, a track record of getting things done. And for us within the LGBT caucus, it's been clear for us it's going to be uh, Caldwell. Caldwell's been there. He understands the project. To change horses this oh, yeah. way down the stream with somebody who has no track record of getting things and done. would otherwise and be against it. Actually, been, against, so. been against it. And you look at what he did when he was in the legislature. He got basically nothing of his own done. When he went to Congress, he sided with, he put the knife in the backs of our first responders when it came to getting their health care. Yeah. So you have to look at the in, in totality of the work of the person and the individual. Granted, within the caucus, we were limited on who we could support because the Democrat versus Republican, mm -hmm. even though it's a nonpartisan race, we're still held by uh, 
who's sure. a member of our party. Sure. So yes, the LGBT caucus did endorse Kirk, but it, we didn't do it wholeheartedly. We didn't do it half-heartedly. We brought him in, we talked to him, and we made sure he knew really he stood. Yeah, you didn't do it on spec. You talked him through. Yeah, we walked. That, him. That, that's an important message, I think, for for really everyone to understand. From caucus to caucus, whether it's Democratic Party or not, especially when it's a nonpartisan office that someone is seeking. You're asking the questions, you're going through the process, and it's not just, well, you, know, you said you're a Democrat, so we're, we're going to go there. So, exactly. okay, that's an important thing to point out. But, okay, um, let's jump Let's jump topics. Okay, the rail is a thing that I, we can spend an entire episode on, and I don't want to do that right now, because the, the mayoral race is more than just the rail. Um, as we know, it's going to be finished in one way or another. We just have to figure out how that's going to happen. So that's one of the challenges. Um, now, I will jump to something that uh, off, off air you were mentioning, and, and you just alluded to it, polls. Mm -hmm. You have recently, Civil Beat has recently done a poll. The only poll that we're aware of at the moment, if there are others, please, everyone can let us know. Uh, but the only polls that have been done thus far for the mayoral race is one that Civil Beat has done. And can you tell us about that, sure. how it happened, what your process was? We released our poll in, in pieces on different races and different issues that are big in Honolulu and on the, the uh, island of Oahu right now. What we found in the mayoral race was that um, Mayor Caldwell has a seven-point lead uh, and uh, this is a 48 to 41 lead that uh, we saw among 832 uh, registered voters who took this poll uh, that has a, a plus minus of 3.4 percent. So we're well outside the margin of error. And I don't think there's any reason to doubt that Mayor Caldwell uh, doesn't have a, a very comfortable uh, lead in this race right now. Um, we might expect that that could uh, grow depending on uh, some of the things that are happening up ballot. Uh, particularly in the presidential race, where uh, we saw evidence in our poll that some of the difficulties that um, Donald Trump is having as the Republican nominee is cascading down even as far as the Honolulu mayoral race, because as we said earlier, it's nonpartisan, but Charles DeJoux, a former congressman, is uh, uh, you know well known to be a Republican here. And that's we're seeing some evidence of drag on the, in the mayoral race there. This could, if it turns into a Hillary route at the presidential level, this could turn out to be have uh, 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 consequences for, uh, for Charles Tissue as well. Certainly, and we know, just to reach nationally for a minute, we know, we've, and I was mentioning earlier, uh, President Obama has even come to endorse Caldwell. Uh, Mayor Caldwell, but he's also been planning. He went up with 120 different down ballot, all the way down into state ballot um, races that he has gone out specifically and sure. endorsed down that level. And that isn't normally something that's done, certainly by a sitting president or, or or anyone at that national level. So that's that's a fascinating thing, and uh, we could spend some time talking about that. Yeah, it's a very so, big deal. Rarely yeah. you, you see a presidential candidate, a, a president, sitting president, take a, a position in a local race like that. Yeah, but yeah. we here at the. LGBT caucus are excited to see this kind of thing happen because you asked earlier what's at stake yeah. and it's everything everything's at stake in the Honolulu mayor's race because the mayor has the most impact on your daily lives well, and civil rights but that's are, what I want to find out that's what I want to find out okay so we, rail is a big thing it's a big topic um, you know, the, the horse race part where, where we actually are mm -hmm. with, with the polls and so forth but okay as far as what is at stake the issues if we've got a Republican in this nonpartisan office versus a Democrat in this nonpartisan office what are the impacts? What are they actually going to be able to achieve or potentially attempt to achieve that would be positive or negative in, on either side? I mean, so the impacts are, okay, we've got a housing and homelessness issue. Okay, so it's a belief. It's a value-based belief on how to proceed. We've got our weed and seed programs. We've got a variety of housing programs, Housing First, that's out there, right, that, that that the mayor is trying to, and the mayor's office, and various agencies within uh, the city and county are trying to address. Well, if we get a new administrator, someone in there from, from a more Republican perspective, who doesn't necessarily hold those same values as far as how to take care of people, is that the impact that we're worried about? Is that, does that come in, and how does that come in? And, and what, what are your thoughts on that? So, talk if you, if you got any. Well, um, you know, I think we can transcend, to some extent, partisan politics when we get to some of these basic uh, quality of life, basic community issues, and I think homelessness, affordable housing are probably at the top of that list. Everyone is impacted by homelessness on this island. Everyone encounters homeless individuals, sees those encampments, sees the difficulties that they're having, putting a roof and shelter uh, over their heads. Uh, it's a problem for business. It's a problem for tourism. It's a problem for 
uh, members of the community who, um, you know, are in the midst of a place where there are people who are living on our streets without any other resources available to them. Likewise, in affordable housing, the need dramatically outstrips the supply here, and we still continue to not see adequate effort being uh, being given toward affordable county, housing. Some of that is state. It's a shared burden between both. There's a big stake in there for the state as well as for the city and county. Um, these these pieces have begun to work together on some of these issues, I think, state and, and local uh, in, in, in better ways over the past uh, couple of years. We're still not seeing enough payoff yet. But so the, 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 the need to increase those efforts is, I would, I would argue, severe. Yeah. But it's how you address those issues. And you're going back to the core values of the person and, the, and, in this case, the party. And everybody's like, oh, it's a nonpartisan race. But you look at who his friends are. You look at who does you would point for directors that in, would have the direct impact in these areas when it comes to social services. Is he going to bring in another Linda uh, uh, Collier? who just decimated DHS while she was there. You look at these, his friends and who he hangs out with and his buddies. These are the people that he's going to be putting in directorships. And they're going to have devastating impacts when it comes to how these things are, when it comes to addressing homelessness. Privatization, they are a big proponent of that. They want to privatize everything. How do you privatize homelessness? And how you would deal with that? How do you privatize how actually help people? people? And yeah. when, you, when your party is the party of no, and he won't even say who he voted for, tells us a great deal about him as a, who he is as a, as a mayoral candidate and where he's going to stand and what he's looking at. And so we have to look at, because it's not just the one issue, one, the one mayor position that we're voting on. We're voting on every director and deputy that he appoints across the board to bring, these, to, to bring these yeah. people in. He, Caldwell has one of the most diverse, progressive directors I've ever had uh, the pleasure of working with. I don't work for the city. I, but I do a lot of stuff with the city in my volunteer work and having advocacy. And I've had the most pleasure of dealing with this diverse and dynamic group of um, directors. You go back and you look at uh, who Lingle had in there, and, and you have to look at the person and look at what they have and look who their friends are and who they would appoint these positions. Okay. Uh, I would we, say we there have may be even another practical, more practical dimension to this too, and that's that in, where, where this is a, an area like this that is so profoundly Democrat, you, you know, practically you increase your chances of efficacy if you're part of that yeah. uh, operation. And we, we're, there, we're, there's, in, there's we're in a place where just down the street, the Senate is about to turn possibly 100% possibly. blue. Possibly. We're hopeful, so which, would be, which would be fascinating. And, and that, that, that will be a back and ask for more funding from the yes. state. I would like to have a conversation about that dynamic uh, in another episode. So I would welcome you both back. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I wanted to give you guys last 10 seconds to top three issues, most important issues for, um, for the mayoral race. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that, but I think we've covered them. We're talking about rail, housing, homelessness, uh, social issues and concerns, and those are important things. And, and then d not just that position, but who they appoint. And those are important reasons and important things to consider with that. So thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. Thank you again for our guests for today, uh, both Mr. Todd Simmons and Mr. Michael Galuya. Uh, and then always, thank you to the staff and crew of Think Tech Hawaii. We will see you next week when we'll have Mr. Dylan Armstrong on talking about the role and impact of the neighborhood board system. So see you next week. Thank you.